If you were sleeping under a rock last year, you might have missed the fact that billions and billions of dollars have been thrown into data infrastructure solutions. Don't believe me, look at the fact that DBT has raised $150 million, Fivetran is upwards of $565 million, Airbyte has also raised $150 million, and Starburst $100 million. And that's just a few examples. If we look at this chart from blockandfiles.com, we will notice that, again, billions have been put into the space of data storage alone. Now, I will point out that for some reason, Fivetran is on here, which doesn't make sense, but if we were to just look at data ingestion tools like Fivetran, we would also see that billions have been thrown into that space as well. So these are just two spaces in the whole data infrastructure pipeline, ingestion and storage. And truthfully speaking, there's at least a dozen more categories that we could probably fill out, all that have had hundreds of millions, if not billions thrown into them. I mean, just look at Matt Turk's data and AI landscape that he has put together. It makes me feel like Madra staring down the Shinobi Alliance. I mean, Look at all these different sections here. There's enough for every one of the different villages, for goodness sakes. And there are just tons and tons of tools that VPs and heads of data can pick from. So it really has become a massive challenge to figure out what exactly belongs in your data stack. In this video, we're going to lay the foundation to help people understand how to develop their data infrastructure, or as some people like to call it, their modern data stack. Now, I have put together a diagram that kind of outlines your baseline data stack. But even this is a little bit intense. And generally speaking, when I start working with clients, what I usually recommend is they focus on three key areas. Those three key areas are ingestion, storage, and then data visualization. Now, luckily I posted about this on LinkedIn and Danny from Y Labs had a great response here, just bringing up the fact that these are great from a technical aspect, but from a human standpoint, there are other things that are nice to have even early on when you're developing your data stack. And I will work to comment on that later in this video. But the way that I view data stacks, I think is very similar to the way that Taylor Brownlow of Count put together this quick and concise chart that helps people understand kind of who they should be hiring and when in terms of a data team as their analytics maturity grows. And as you can see in this image, when you first start out, you pretty much just generally have a dev and an analyst. Maybe your company is only four people and you know, you've got your dev, maybe an analyst, a few other people that work for you and then you as a CEO. So most likely what ends up happening is the dev ends up extracting data manually, sends it over to someone from the business side. Maybe you don't even have an analyst and then that person will end up doing some things in Excel. Here in this data stack, you really have nothing, right? Like if you were to look at what your current data stack looks like, it's Excel you probably haven't put together a data warehouse and it would be very expensive to do so. And it's probably not worth it from an ROI perspective or in terms of your priorities when you have such a small team to kind of try to automate a lot of this and develop things like a data warehouse that take at least one person to kind of manage and develop. But as your company grows, you know, you've got 10 employees, 12 employees, you're starting to handle more and more transactions, right? Like you're starting to see hundreds and thousands of transactions in a day. You maybe have six, seven, 10 data sources that now need to kind of all be reported on. Now it's when you can start thinking about hiring someone like a data engineer who can start actually developing a data warehouse. You're more likely going to get that ROI at this point. But again, at this point, more than likely what your data stack is going to look like is ingestion, storage, and then some visualization or reporting. Again, this is very lightweight because more than likely, if you only have one data engineer and one analyst who are really kind of juggling a lot of these tasks, having things like lineage and observability might not be a great investment from a tool perspective, and you might want to instead focus on just doing that in like Excel. Just so at the very least you kind of understand your general flow, but aren't investing a ton of your valuable time and resources in another tool, because every tool inevitably creates technical debt, maintenance requirements, and just something else to upkeep. But as your company grows, you will inevitably start to get to the baseline kind of modern data stack that I've outlined here in this image because you're gonna start needing things like lineage and observability and making it so that data is not just pulled into the data warehouse, but it's easy to find. I think that's one of the key things in terms of like creating data. You need to be able to create a way and a set of processes that don't just pull that data in, but one, help make it easy for people to understand what data is valid and what data is like test and research data that's just coming from data scientists versus like your more core data sets, as well as trying to make it easy for analysts to figure out how all your data connects where it's all coming from and doing things like creating standards in terms of how you're actually marking things like data types, you know, timestamps should have some sort of consistent nomenclature, usually like underscore TS, same thing with like Booleans, oftentimes people pick here, something like is underscore active 
uh, is a pretty common one. You know, just try and say if something is active, it's usually something like that where you have standards. So one, you've got all this tooling to help people find the data. You also have improved data quality because no longer can a data engineer sit there and manually, uh, you know, pr try to figure out if data is accurate or not. They're more likely going to need to spend more of their time building new data pipelines as well as data tests and things of that nature so that you can automate it. That way, again, that they can move quickly and they're not forced to constantly have to stop, do quick manual tests and really slow down their whole process. Now you're gonna see there's a ton of different components here. You've got somewhere where you're likely storing your raw files, staging data, you're doing something maybe with DBT. You've probably got things that involve notebooks and having those on the cloud. One thing that's not covered here is more than likely those notebooks might just be attached directly to the raw data section rather than waiting for data engineers to get all of the data. Sometimes, you know, data scientists will just do research directly um, on raw data, which can make sense if they believe that there's value in that data, but the data engineers have not had time to pull it yet. But overall, this is a baseline data stack. Again, this is kind of what you will need as you are maturing and growing. You'll notice I don't even cover everything here. For example, I kind of left out reverse ETLs because more than likely, if you don't have data lineage, what's gonna end up happening if you do implement something like a reverse ETL is you're gonna have spaghetti data or like just data that basically depends on itself where you end up creating some sort of metric or something and then sending it back to Salesforce or somewhere and then pulling that value back into your data warehouse. I've seen it happen even at large companies. It happens all the time because again, data just becomes very hard to track and what feeds what and where's what going gets very lost without having some sort of ability to track data lineage. Now, the reason that I put together this diagram is actually more than just this video. What is going to happen here now is I'm going to make a series of videos where we're gonna go over each one of these sections individually. So for example, where we talk about batch data and extraction, we're going to probably talk about EL. I usually clump those together because they naturally kind of have an affinity together. So we'll talk about what exactly is EL, kind of what is its purpose, what tools can be used here for the EL section, you know, what are kind of the different options that people use from maybe the most custom code option to maybe more of the tooling side where things are just solutions. We'll also go into things like streaming, different types of data warehousing, uh, DBT, and just all of these different sections along the way, because here's the thing, the modern data stack or whatever you want to call it is very complicated. There's a lot of different components and tons of different choices. Dozens of tools alone are just in data observability alone. And that's very meta and very personally down the path of analytical maturity. Like you've got to be pretty mature as a company to have implemented that kind of a tool and find the value from it. You know, in a perfect world, you would implement it almost immediately as you start developing all of your data pipelines. But in reality, I often find that this is something that comes down the line once people finally realize that their pipelines are becoming a mess and they need something in terms of a data observability tool to help kind of track it all from a lineage perspective, as well as something that helps you search what data actually exists in all of your data warehouses or data lakes or whatever uh, systems that you have put together. So this will be our map for this discussion. And I'm sure I will add maybe different portions or sections along the way, maybe because I missed some things or maybe because as we're going, I would like to discuss other components along the way. If you feel like something is missing, please feel free to write a comment below. Other than that, thank you so much for watching this video. I look forward to kind of explaining all of these different sections and components in the next few weeks. Honestly, let's be real, probably months because it's going to take me a while to build the series, but I am really excited for it and I hope you guys are too. Have a great day and goodbye.